Good morning. How is everybody doing today? Very good. Beautiful Sunday. A little rainy, but uh, still beautiful. Thank you for being here today, November 12th, 2017. The year is almost over. Um, as you all know, or those that don't know, Becerra de Meneses is a Spiritist Association. It's a non-profit. We only uh, function with donations and uh, a lot of help uh, with volunteers. Um, our mission is, and duty is to uh, study Spiritism and promote the practice of spiritual and material charity. Our phone numbers, our phone number is 305-477-4148. Our email is info at spiritist.com. And our website is www.spiritist.com. This lecture is being broadcast live online on www.youtube.com, Becerra Miami. One word. Please turn your uh, cellulars off or in vibrate. Thank you. Donations are always welcome. Like uh, we said before, it's uh, to keep these doors open. Uh, I understand that we have like a $5,000 a month overhead. So every dollar counts. Thank you very much. Uh, our podcast is 24-7, Portuguese, English, and Spanish. Uh, we have great speakers like Umberto Fabri, Simone Privato, and one of our own, Enis Cuadros, and many, many more. We have different and interesting subjects like how to defeat death, what is the, what is the Paris spirit, se separation and divorce, a very uh, common uh, everyday uh, theme. Spiritism is science, afraid of death, etc etc we have over 500 programs uh just going to radio.spiritus.com click on the program of your choice it's free and you can listen to this in your radio in your in your um, telephone your tablets today we're going to be reading from our daily bread our book our daily bread this book was written by our dear francisco candido javier and it was dictated by the spirit of emmanuel We'll be talking about chapter 64, Better to Suffer in Righteousness. It is better, if it's God's will, to suffer for doing good than for doing evil. Now, this was said by Peter, uh, chapter 3, verse 17. Human beings sometimes to accumulate financial resources that he will be compelled to abandon precipitously. I hope I said that right acquires the deplorable illnesses that corrode his centers of force, resulting in an undesirable death. By purchasing short-lived sensations for his physical body, he commonly acquires dangerous evils which accompany his existence until his last days on earth. Oops. By getting extremely upset over insignificant lessons he finds on his path, he poisons vital organs, thereby creating a fatal imbalance in his physical life. By stuffing his stomach on certain occasions, like we, some of us do, a vice is established affecting important organs of, this, of his physiological instrument, thus impeding the perfect function of organs for the simple pleasure of gluttony. <clears throat> Do I fear facing the obstacles of a clear path of love and wisdom if the dark road of hatred and ignorance remains replete with vengeful and disturbing forces? Why be afraid of fatigue and exhaustion, complications and incomprehension, conflicts and disappointments? which are the consequence of the blessed battle for the supreme victory of righteousness, when the combat for the, for the provisional triumph of evil conduces to tributes of afflictions and sufferings? Let us utilize our best possibilities in the service to Jesus Christ by pledging our lives to him. The criminal weapon that is destroyed and the weak that smokes and gets consumed always provoke curse and darkness. But for the exhausted worker doing his duty, and for the lamb that is extinguished during the illuminating service, 
a different destiny is reserved. So we need to keep working hard. In reflection about today's reading, in today's reading, Emmanuel reminds us that it's better to suffer for doing good than for doing bad. He mentions how humanity wastes time and resources in purchasing brief and transitory material things that only produce illnesses and corrodes our soul and body, causing unexpected and undesirable death. It reminds us not to be afraid of fatigue and exhaustion, complications and insensitivity, conflicts and disappointments we experience, as these are just results of the battle we face in our way to reach the supreme victory in the service to Jesus. The criminal tools and weapons used will bring pain and darkness, but for the exhausted worker and for the lamp that is extinguished in the Lord's service, a different destiny is reserved. And with those words, and to begin today's gospel, let's do a little prayer. Let's relax our minds. Let's put behind all the issues that we had during the week. Let's elevate our thoughts to the Almighty and thank Him. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here today, this beautiful, glorious Sunday. Thank you, dear Jesus, for the opportunity to serve. Thank you for this center, thank you for all the mentors that have been here since early this morning preparing this center with harmony and love and good vibrations. Thank you, dear Lord, for the brothers and sisters that are here today and that are watching us through the internet. Thank you for all the blessings. We ask you, dear Lord, first of all, for, for world peace, we ask you to give us, to each one of us, the opportunity to look inside of our souls because peace begins with us. Peace begins with our family, our friends, our neighbors. We ask you, dear Lord, to share your light upon our path so that we can reach someday the goals that you have set for us. We ask you, dear Lord, to provide for those that are hungry, that are suffering, especially for those children around the world that have no food or no shelter. We ask you, dear Lord, to share your mercy upon them, even the strength they need to continue the battle, their test, their trials and expiations. Thank you for the opportunity to be here once again. And we ask you to enlighten our brother, Leo Rodriguez, as he speaks today about the gospel. And we ask you, dear Lord, to open our hearts and our souls so that we can learn from this and take it home with us. We ask you this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. And today our brother Leo is going to be talking about gospel, about chapter 17. Be perfect. Thank you. Good morning. It's no coincidence, as we know from our, our studies of spiritism, the, uh, the gospel tells us that we are where we need to be at, the, at this perfect time no and it was uh it was asked of me to do this chapter a couple of days ago but i embraced it instead of getting upset about it i'd be like oh you know and i, I thought about it because i was i was saying man they haven't asked me to talk in a long time you know maybe they're trying to silence me or something which is going to be real hard to do in this lifetime. But I, sh I should embrace the opportunity, you know, and, and 
and try to make something fruitful out of the, the lesson. And the title is so beautiful. It's be perfect. You know, the chapter, the title of the chapter 17 is be perfect. And in retrospect, uh, as I read, I read it, I had read the gospel several times before, but I, I um, was reading it more with more hunger, you know, like wanting to, to, to get the, the bulk of what really, really was saying, because I noticed how some people, when they do their, their presentations, they literally read the chapter, no? They read like about, you know, and then they talk about it and read it because they don't want to miss anything. And that's exactly what happens in this chapter. This chapter is beautiful in its, in its presentation. You got to give Kardec so much credit. This is he's an incredible spirit, you know, to have compiled this in the way that he did, you know, and to, to set a chapter in, in, in title, Be Perfect, right? Because Jesus said that you sh this this I'm quoting Jesus right. He says, "Love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who persecute and slander you. Or if you love only those who love you, what reward will you have? Do not the publicans do the same? If you greet only your brothers, what are you doing that is more than what others do?" Do not the pagans also do the same? Therefore, be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. So, a lot of people would say, right? Would say, that's, that's you know, seems like it's very difficult, you know, to even think, right? That we should strive to be perfect like God is perfect because it's not, it doesn't work that way. God is perfect. And if we were, this is what the gospel says, if we were perfect, or, you know, then there we'd be like like God or we would be, you know, and that's supposedly like a an impossibility. But when you study and you read what what Kardec, I mean, what Jesus meant, I'm sorry, what Jesus meant is to give us a goal. Okay? He couldn't say be perfect like me because that would not have that, you know, that wouldn't be his humbleness because he was humble. But if he said, be perfect like our father in heaven is, it was giving us a, like a role model, something to, to shoot at. See, this is very interesting. It tells us that perfection is not a goal, all right? We, we're born simple and ignorant according to our doctrine, right? And then it's like, in other words, we're, we're starting from zero. We're, you know, we're pretty uh, brand new right out of the pocket. So we acquire through our experiences on earth, we acquire different situations or we're confronted with different situations that allow us to learn life's lessons. All right? In our effort to, to reach perfection, we have to go through stages. Okay? We have to fight our vices. We have to know ourselves. That's something beautiful that our deck says. Know yourself. No? I'm not mistaken. I think, did Jesus say that too? Or it was only Kardec? That's the old spiritist. Was it Jesus said know yourself too? Or it was Kardec that said it? Kardec? All right, okay. But... You know, you have to know yourself <clears throat> real well in order to start this transformation or, or this pathway towards perfection, all right? We have, to, we have to deal with our relationships. The way we deal with our relationships influences our, our path towards perfection. Remember that the rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you? See, so that's one example of, you know, if you're on the right path towards perfection, you check yourself and you say, do I treat people the way I want to be treated? All right. Practicing virtues. We said this before, that when we were created or when we are created, we're created with, with certain 
seeds, the seeds of the knowledge of the existence of God, and all the virtues are there. We don't have to go anywhere to look for these virtues or to develop the virtues. We have to, we have to develop them from within. Uh, and moral improvement. Our moral improvement is very important in our, in our road towards perfection because we're here, according to the doctrine, we're here to develop, to grow, to grow intellectually and spiritually. In order to grow spiritually, you have to develop your moral, you have to develop your moral attitude. You know what I'm saying? Your, your, your spirituality, I guess I could, I could put it that way. All right? This is interesting. Perfection is a process see, that we go through. We don't wake up and then, okay, I accepted the doctrine. I like the doctrine. And now I'm, you know, and now I'm going to strive towards perfection. No, it's a, it's a process, little by little, you know, <laughs> incarnation by incarnation. The, the interesting thing is, or the beauty of it is, that it's up to us. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's up to the individual how fast he wants to progress. That's the beauty of God's creation. When he created us, he endowed us with free will. So through our... The exercise of our free will, if we make the right decisions, we can attain relative, see, this is the word, relative perfection. Our dear Kardec makes that clarification, see, the perfection is relative, all right? You know, you can't, you can't ever imagine yourself would be as perfect as God, but you can attain relative perfection, which these... You know, when we study about the uh, categories of the spirits and they say that the pure spirits, the pure spirits have attained. They acquire a relative perfection. Okay. If it doesn't sound right, raise your hand. As I was reading this book, it was, uh, okay, we spoke for that. There's a question that Kardec says, God has created all the spirits in a state of simplicity and ignorance. That is to say, without knowledge. We went over that already. See, I get ahead of myself. All right? The vices of the body, the vices of the soul. That's one thing that we have to, in our, in, on, on our trajectory, on our road, our path towards perfection, that's what we have to check. See? Because we, did, what do you call it? We tend to, to establish connections, right, with with the material around us, you know, with the world, and we and, and we just like what you were reading, you know, we we tend to to overeat, you no know, gluttony. We we create our own vices, the vices of the soul, depending on the connection that we make with certain spirits. They, you know, they lead us literally lead us towards a life of vices. So that's why our divine master said, pray and watch. Very, you know, very important. I always say, remember that, I think I said that before, that there's a saying, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And, and you know, our Christian brothers say the devil, right? The devil, the devil. But we know that what it implies is spirits of a lower, you know, that are frivolous, that, that want us to be in, you know, involved in vices and everything so that they can satisfy their desires and their needs all right so in this in the book our daily bread there's a reading it says that it is indispensable all right to recognize that the nourishment of the soul in order to become molded definitely requires a sincere heart interested in the divine truths what it's saying is you have to keep it real, you know. You have to you have to be real to yourself, all right, and to others. All right. You have to have a sincere heart in everything that you do, even in your thoughts. Better 
Oh, this is awesome. Better to suffer in righteousness. That's, that's similar to what you read. Right. It's so beautiful. I don't, I wouldn't say that, what do you call it? That the spirits help us, but it's so beautiful how things come together, right? In the, in the opening reading, it was saying that how, how important this is, all right? By getting extremely upset over insignificant lessons, we poison our vital organs, thereby creating a fatal imbalance in our physical life. This, all of this information comes to us through this beautiful doctrine, all right? When Jesus said, you reap what you sow, that's what he was saying, literally, all right? In, 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 in cap, I'm trying to use big words, encapsulating, right, this, this, this whole idea that spiritism comes in and, and opens it up and makes it a lot more clearer to us, that's it. This, that book, I don't know if you guys read that auto discovery by, by Devaldo Pereira Franco through his spirit guide, one of the Angelus. Auto self discovery, I'm sorry, self discovery. It, it got translated to English. That's, that's what they point out, you know, how, you know, you, you, your mental attitudes and your thoughts, right? And this anger and this hatred and all this stuff, it affects your organs. We attended a, a presentation on Friday in Deerfield by this gentleman that's going to come here and, and do a presentation for us. He's a psychologist, but he's also a spiritist psychologist. And he was, he was elaborating on the beauty of that book, you know, how sometimes we think that we're not like that, you know, because we're spiritists or because we're spiritual, right? And he was narrating an example of the lady, they were celebrating her like 50th or something anniversary, right? And all of a sudden she starts opening up about how, you know, she had put up with this man for so many years and how much, how much he had tormented her, how difficult he had made her life, you know, and, Thank God, you know, thank God for the doctrine and the teachings and all this and that. But, right, she hadn't realized that she hadn't changed, that she hadn't allowed spiritism to transform her and to help her to, to free herself from those feelings. Sometimes we harbor, sometimes we harbor things inside of us that we don't even, how do you call it, we're not aware of. It's, it's, I guess it's like in our subconscious. I have a... One of my, one of my ex mother in laws, bless her heart. She's such a beautiful person, right? But for years and years and years and years, she always talked about how her husband, you know, had did her wrong. How her husband, you know, how her husband, and and the kids never said nothing, you know, like you know, mom, come on, leave it alone, or you know. Leave it like, you know, it's time to let bygones be bygones. And we do that. We don't even realize that. Okay, vices of the soul. This, was a, this is an example of what we were talking about. See? Hatred, envy. Hatred, envy, vengeance, intolerance, all right? The desire for power and resentment, all of these things things stem around two things that our divine master always combated which was selfishness and pride because as we study and we know now for a fact we know that it's the opposite of of, of charity and humility you can't have one without the other you, you can't be selfish and full of pride and be humble and charitable at the same time it's either you're this or you're that so and it eats, it eats at you. That's what it's showing in this diagram. All right? What is the greatest obstacle to progress? Pride and selfishness, see? The, to the moral progress is what they make reference to in, in the book of the spirits. All right? I really invite you guys to read this chapter. Um, 
like slowly just absorbing the content of it is so beautiful i had even i what if i had even made notes to it and then i uh i was blessed with these powerpoints and then i, I was like overwhelmed i was like man these are beautiful these are beautiful powerpoints and sometimes the powerpoints are good because you guys read and i kind of explain a little bit but the two senses you know, now we're not only using one sense, now we're using two senses, sight and, and hearing. It's very interesting. I was finding that out that they were, they were saying that when you do presentations, you know, even though you have individuals that don't use PowerPoints and they make the presentations interesting and everything, and they keep you well, well informed and everything, the company, if they are accompanied with PowerPoints, it adds to the... To this to the enrichment of the of the presentation jesus gave us an example of charity and then pontius pilate gave us an example of selfishness sacrifice of self-interest all right which is the most meritorious of all the virtues right all virtues are meritorious for all of them are signs of progress on the upward road the highest of all virtues is that which takes the form of the widest and most in disinterested kindness. Okay? That's how you gauge yourself. You see, when you want to see how much progress you're making, you you know, you say, you know, when I do charity, do I do charity because I enjoy it, because of the pleasure that it brings me? Or do I do it because it's a it's a duty? The book speaks of duty. Practicing virtues will naturally dim the vices. It can't be good and bad. The more good you you do, the more you separate yourself from the bad. And eventually, as you progress morally in your moral education, you realize you can't serve both God and Mammon. You see, you can't like the like the old saying says you can't burn the candle on both ends. Sooner or later, this is so beautiful because it says that I think it's in in the uh, in the chapter it says that your conscience we were endowed with a conscience, right? As we study and we develop our our spirituality, it seems like our our conscience becomes more aware of its surroundings, and you know, and our conscience actually. Uh, mortifies us when we do bad you know we we already know before we could do bad when we were young we did bad and we didn't care and you know we were selfish and full of pride and it was all about us now we become spiritists and then if we backslide and we do something wrong our conscience just you know just torments at us just eats at us because why because we're awakening it's like paul said now it's the new me it's not the old you know, Leo or, you know, it's the new me. See, as we develop our moral progress, selfishness will give way to charity. Pride gives way to humility and so on. This is part of the gospel of this chapter. The good person, the good spiritist, duty, superior and inferior spirits, body and spirit. The good person, the truly, this is beautiful, the truly good person is one who complies with the laws of justice. I keep looking over there. With the laws of justice, love, and charity in their highest degree of purity. In the highest degree. You know what I'm saying? Not just to do a little bit of, you know, like a little bit here and a little bit there. No, to, to give it all you have, to give it all you you know, or you're, you're able to do. Like the message said this morning, you know, that you're tired at the end of the day because you did so much good. Yeah, you know, not just good to, to do enough good to, to wash your conscience or, you know, to satisfy your conscience. No, you did good until there was no more good to be done at that particular day. See, it's not fragmented, all right? Can be done in fragments. It's got to be done. What do you call it? all or nothing? Did I go wrong? 
or this is, I like this, true spiritists can be recognized by their moral transformation and the efforts they make to overcome their bad instincts. You know, we, we're going to have bad instincts at the beginning of our journey. As we're, as we're coming out of that infancy of spiritual infancy, you know, we're born ignorant and, and uh, born ignorant and simple. And that's the word I can't hear. Simple? I'm not simple. <laughs> but no, we're born ignorant and simple. And then we, we, we do develop things that, you know, that we pick up along the way. But as we, as we, when we come to this beautiful doctrine and we, how does that call it? We, we take it into ourselves and we decide that, okay, you know what? I'm going to allow this to change me, right? And that, that's what Kardec talks about. When a true spiritist, had, a good spiritist, a true spiritist, a good Christian, right? They're all the same. It says it right in the book. I have it in my notes. It's so beautiful. It says right here that the true the true spiritists and the true Christian are the same. All right? They're all they're one in the same. See? Spiritism, when well understood, but especially when well felt, inevitably leads to the results above which characterize the true spiritists as well as the true Christian. For they are one and the same. My father always strived to, to stress that, to emphasize that. You know, the spiritism is nothing that, you know, that we should be worried about because it was just the continuation of, you know, of Christianity. That it was just something that Christ promised us and fulfilled his promise by giving us this beautiful doctrine. All right? Duty, okay, moral duty begins exactly at the point where the happiness or the tranquility of our neighbors is threatened and therefore terminates at the limit we would not wish to be passed in relation to ourselves. The book tells us, the chapter tells us that we have a duty first towards God, right? We have a duty to God to be exemplary what do you call obedient, exemplary, you know? Another duty we have is towards our fellow human beings. I was talking to some young people, and I was telling them, we have a duty, and if we met our duty, if we fulfilled our duty as human beings, there would not be no hunger, no poverty, and no Ill illiteracy on our planet. If we, you know, if we fulfilled our duty as human beings towards our fellow brothers and sisters, that's a, that's a heavy reality. That's a harsh reality to know that there's people starving, right? Because of our selfishness and our pride. I, good thing I'm not rich because, you know, uh, I probably would be poor by now, you know. When knowing this, I'd be like, man, I got to find out how I can help. But see, but the beauty of charity is that it doesn't have to all be monetarily. You know what I'm saying? It doesn't have to be all about money. There's people that are doing a lot of charity and they don't even have money. And we, we ourselves, you know, we can, we can do so much with so little. Free will. This is beauty. This is beautiful. We have the free will. We, we have you know, the uh, ability to choose our path. What are we going to do? You know, how much charity are we going to do? Um, how, are, how much are we going to allow this doctrine to transform us so that when we leave here, at least we'll have the satisfaction of knowing I did all right, you know. I remember my dad said the same thing when he was, you know, leaving. He's like, I'm, I'm all right. I'm satisfied. You know, I, I did what I could do. But I, you know, but I wish that I could have did much more. He knew that he could have done a lot more, you know. But, but he was he was content with how much he had already done. All right. The same thing is going to happen to us, or you know, when we're like on our last days here on earth, we're going to be maybe we're going to be lamenting. Maybe we may be saying, you know, man, I wish I could have did a lot more. 
but I was just lazy. You know, I was not as productive as I could have been, knowing that you could have been, because that's the reality. All right? Superior and, and inferior spirits. The challenge of authority. You know that with authority comes a lot of responsibility. And, and, and in this chapter, it tells us that. You know? It's, it's, it's the same thing as when they said, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. When you're in a position of authority or superiority, you have a responsibility. You know, you, you don't push your authority around like a bully. You know, you have to, what do you call it? You have to be authoritative with compassion to understand that, you know, these brothers and sisters, you know, maybe they're not as bright as you, but maybe you weren't as bright as, you know, as you are now because you, you, you know, you're climbing up the scale. You're ascending up the scale, progressing. Right? Maybe intellectually, maybe morally. But you started down here, and they're down here. And that's where the, the compassion comes forward. These people, these people that they put in our path, right? Brothers and sisters that they, even our kids, sometimes it's our kids. Our, I know I helped my father progress because, you know, I was real difficult. I was a, a basket case. And, and my father, you know, my father understood because of the doctrine, he understood that he had a, a responsibility. And all he kept doing was planting seeds, planting seeds. He didn't try to, he didn't try to transform me because he knew he couldn't transform me. We can't save anybody. You know, you save yourself. They say that Christ saves you. Yeah, his teachings, his love. All right, but you have the last say so you are the one that says enough that's it finito body and spirit in the chapter it tells us that we have to care not only for our spirit but for our body a lot of people think that they have to chastise their body you know that they have to make you know have to suffer and endure hardships and all of that that's not what god wants us to do because this is Remember, Jesus said, this is the vessel. This is the vessel of our spirit. We have to take care of the vessel because we're, we're going to have to give an account for it. All right? Every, that's the beauty of this doctrine. It clarifies. It opens everything up. It lays everything on the table. So there's no excuse. It says it here. See? The beauty of it is the simple in mind and the intellectual all have the same opportunity to learn if they just open up their heart. The reflections of St. Augustine about self-knowledge, right? At the close of each day, I examined my conscience, reviewed all that I had done, and asked myself whether I had not failed in some duty. That's what, what I call food for thought, right? I think if I'm not... Oh, no, the parable of the sower. I'm sorry. It's so excited. The parable of the sower. Everybody knows the parable of the sower? Or so, so. Jesus, Jesus came out on, on the, uh, the water. I don't know if it was the lake, the lake or the beach or what, but he came out by the water. There were so many people. He just drew people to him, right? People hungered for his word. It's so beautiful, right? And they like a multitude. So he went out on a boat. And then he, he said the, the parable of the sower. He said a man went out to sow, you know, to plant seeds. Threw some of the seeds on the ground. But they, they didn't have time to, to how does that call it? To, to be, right? Yeah, right. And the birds came and took them away. Then... He planted some other ones, and they fell on rocks, and in between rocks. When they germinated, right, when they opened up, there was no soil to, to nourish them, and the sun came and withered them, burned them away. Then, 
Some of them fell on thorns, in between the thorns, right? When they started blooming, the thorns killed them, you know, destroyed them. They weren't able to flourish because the thorns damaged them, destroyed them. And finally, some fell on fertile soil and they grew and they multiplied, all right? So he says, I gotta go back to my book. Every time I read in the gospel according to Spiritus, I'm so amazed at Kardec. You know, when you like you hear about Kardec and, and you study Kardec and this and that, but it was such a beautiful, you know, collection of work, the dedication, his dedication to the whole thing, you know. It says here the he okay, then he says, He who has ears. Let him hear. This is Jesus speaking. All right. Hear, therefore, the parable of the sower. Whoever hears the word of the kingdom, but does not heed it, the evil spirit comes and takes away what has been sown in his heart. This is the one who received the seed by the wayward. In other words, where it just fell on the ground. He who received the seed among the stones is the one who hears the word. And rece receives it joyously, and as soon as he hears it, but he has no roots in himself, and it lasts only for a while. And when he is overcome by obstacles and persecutions, on account of the word, he soon regards it as an object of offense and ruin. Sometimes we don't even realize it, but we blame God. All right, we blame God for our choices. We don't even make the connection. We, you know, we don't, we don't realize that there's nothing to blame God about. Why is this happening to me? Right? What have you done, Lord? Did you forget me? No. Have you forsaken me? <sighs> he who receives the seed among the thorns is the one who hears the word. But then the cares of time and the illusions of rich chokes the word within him. Render it, rendering it unfruitful. There's some of us who hear it, who hear the word of Christ and the teachings of, you know, of Christ. And we think it's so beautiful, you know. But right now, you know, we're, we're kind of busy, you know. We're busy chasing the dollar, you know. We're busy with other preoccupations. We really don't have time, you know, for, for the teachings of Christ. It's not our priority. We haven't learned to prioritize Christ above all things. And then he who receives the seed, on, oh no, I'm sorry. But he who receives the seed on good soil is the one who hears the word, who heeds it, and who produces a crop, rendering a hundred or sixty or thirty to one. So what it's what it tells us in there is that this also. You know, this also represents different spiritists in, in, the, in here it says, right? That we have different types of spiritists just like this, right? Some spiritists come one day a week. That's fine. That's great. That's, you know, that satisfies them. That's who are we to judge, right? Others come three days a week. Fine, right? There's some that literally live here. You see them every day, every day, every day, every day. And then they, each one of them falls in a different classification, right? But the true spirit is, right, is recognized by his transformation, his inner transformation, and his desire to be better and better and better. Like they say, more better, more better. All right? So if you want to gauge yourself, you want to see where am I at? What am I, you know, what am where, where am I on the scale, right, of, of this pathway towards perfection? Has this doctrine really, really taken roots? You know, have the seeds really germinated inside of you? Huh? Do you really feel that you are becoming a better human being? Are you learning to love your enemy? Are you emotional and when I... Speak about that. 
but I'm getting better at it. Um, something that I find so beautiful is is that this word that I just developed, <clears throat> unconditional, <sighs> unconditional love. That's the essence. That's the the goal. When <laughs> when we learn, or not not learn. <clears throat> When we get to the point where we develop that virtue of love to the extent, right, that we love unconditionally, we're going to be real, real, real close. All right. So <laughs> I, I can't believe it. I was doing so good. <laughs> I, I think, what do you call it? I think we pretty much um, covered the chapter. Thank you for your patience. And all these beautiful notes. Uh, well, uh, let's take a deep breath. Let's take a deep breath and take in all this wonderful energy that surrounds us. Even thanks to our Creator for having blessed us with our perfect role model our beloved master and teacher Jesus Christ who loved us unconditionally we pray for the strength the perseverance the determination and above all the humility to take his example and apply it to our everyday lives so we can become better human beings we also pray, Heavenly Father, for all our brothers and sisters who don't know the love of Christ in their lives. We pray for your mercy that in this lifetime they may get to know this love. We pray, Heavenly Father, that collectively, as one people, we may put aside our selfishness and our pride and come together and do away with hunger and poverty and illiteracy on our planet and thus contribute to its transformation to a planet of higher consciousness. We pray, Heavenly Father, a prayer of gratitude for all the workers of our center, for the mentors that watch over our center with so much love and dedication. We pray for our loved ones wherever they may be. We pray for all our programs of our center, for our food pantry, for our fluid therapy, for the educational department. And we thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day, for this life, and for this beautiful doctrine. We pray as we close our gospel for today, that your will may be done in our lives today and always. So be it.